Good morning and welcome to Church Online. Thanks for joining us. I hope you're having a great day. I want to start this morning with a scripture from Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. You know, sometimes we get tempted to just think about the bad things that are happening, especially in a time like this where we're quarantined and, and things are crazy. We don't understand everything that's going on. And, and David gives us a great reminder in this passage to think about the good things that God has done. And, and even to go as further to say the good things that God is doing now in these times and to tell others about it and to sing him praises because of it. And so that's what I, that's what I want for us this morning, that we would be able to sing praises because of the good things God has done and the good things God is doing. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for today and for your blessings, for who you are and for the good things that you have done. God, we praise you for the good things that you are doing. And I pray that we would just be able to focus on that this morning, get rid of distractions, get rid of the negativity, and turn our eyes and turn our hearts to you, that we would be able to worship and sing praises to you this morning. God, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together this morning. My sin and penalty at 
At the cross you took my place With your grace on top of grace
Well, here we are. At home. In our living rooms. With our families. With those we love. Today, wherever you are located, know that you are not alone. You are not alone. We're still connected. Today, we gather as one body. One body. One body. Because the church is not a building. It never has been. It never has been. We gather today as one church. One church. To lift up one name. The name of Jesus. 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 So wherever you are, today is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day to give him thanks. So let's unite. Let's worship. Let's praise his name. For he is worthy of it today and every day. Because we are still the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. Hey, it's Haley. Here's what's happening. Our student groups are continuing to meet throughout this week on Zoom. On Monday at 6.30, our Bells, our girls group will be meeting, and at 7.15, our Rangers, our boys group will be as well. Then on Thursday, our teenagers will be hanging out together around 6.30. And our Bible study is continuing this week, Wednesday night at 7 on Zoom. Our series is called Anxious for Nothing, and we are on session four. Make sure that you do watch the video before our discussion time on Wednesday. Also, thank you for continuing to support the church. Remember, we have four different ways to give. You can text your amount to 84321 and follow the instructions. Download our Church Center app in the App Store. Visit our website, newlifecovenantcog.churchcenter.com slash giving. Or mail in a check or put it in the drop box by the chapel entrance. That's all for this week. I'm Haley and we'll see you later. This has been the strangest week. Everything I've been doing is backwards all week long. that we've been learning about we've been talking about humility and you know what else I think humility is kind of a backwards way to live putting others first thinking about others more than yourselves man Jesus just taught us to do things kind of backwards I'm so glad you've been with us this week this is our last lesson on our series on humility so I'm getting ready to go post it, and I want to make sure that you tune in and check it out because next week we're starting something brand new. We we'll miss you guys. See you soon. All right, it's that time again, another opportunity to get into God's Word together. Uh, we're in our series called Reset. We've talked about our devotion and becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. We've talked about our mindset and not just believing in the resurrection, but living out the resurrection. We've talked about our priorities and centering our lives around God. And today, Pastor JJ is going to talk about resetting our expectations for the future because we've never been here before. So here's Pastor JJ. Well, good morning, everybody. Let me start today by just asking you a question. Did you ever think that we would be here today? 
I'm not talking about like sitting in your living room thinking about uh, what you're going to eat for lunch today with your family. I'm, I'm talking about how our entire world is in this global pandemic right now. Did we ever think that we would be here? I mean, it's crazy how quickly it all happened and how much it's affected all of our daily lives, really of billions of people. I think it would be, um, it would be an understatement to say that we, that we expected all of this, right? Well, and if, we, if we didn't expect the virus to be so life-altering, then how do we know what to expect in the future when the virus isn't as widespread and when, when some of the social gathering limitations and the ban and all those things have been lifted? How, how do we know what it's going to be like in the future? Well, I, I'd like to wrestle with, with some of these ideas today um, as we talk about resetting our expectations for the future. Um, I'd like to use our time together to really just bring some clarity maybe and cast some vision about what our future might look like as a church when we get back to normal. Now, let me just say this right up front. If, if you have been thinking, man, I just can't wait until we, we get rid of this virus stuff and it all goes away so that we can get back to the way things were before. If, if you've been saying that, I've, I've got some sobering news for you. The reality is that things will never go back to the way they were before. It's much like how our country changed after 9-11. Our country and our culture are forever affected by this pandemic. Now, before you, you start thinking that, oh, he's just being dramatic, let me just spend some time explaining how our expectations might need some adjusting. There's so many areas of our lives uh, that, that are, we're going to have to make adjustments to when this stay-at-home order um, is lifted and the restrictions aren't in place anymore. And a lot of these areas that, that are, are going to need some attention, you're going to have to navigate them personally because they're specific to your situation. Other areas we're going to have to work together on as a community. But then there's also this, this aspect of, for those of us that belong to a church, we're going to have some major adjustments to make when it comes to how do we do church. So you might have realized that what I'm talking about is this nasty idea. It's almost a bad word, but it's called change. Now, I'm sorry that, you know, I know, I know that it's rude of me to use that type of language in front of the children, but it's unavoidable because change is a coming, whether we are ready for it or we're not but I'd like to propose that this season of change and the season of transition uh, is actually God's specialty. It's really where God tends to shine throughout history during times like this. And, and I was thinking about this the other day and I was reminded of, of the, the Hebrews uh, in the Old Testament after they, they came out of Egypt um, and how God led this traveling nation in the wilderness for generations and he appeared to them as a cloud hovering over their, their tabernacle. And so I want to look at Exodus chapter 40 for just a minute and, and look, at, look at how God led this, this traveling nation of, of Israelites. In chapter 40, verse 36, he says, In all uh, the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night. What an amazing sight that would, that would be. In the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. So we have this imagery of this tabernacle with this cloud over it, representing the presence of God. And any time the cloud would stay over the tabernacle, they knew that they were staying there, and so they would set up camp. And, and kind of like get settled in. But then once the cloud would move, whenever that was, they would have to pack up everything and go. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine just totally depending on this cloud every day to know if you were going to stay or if you were going to go? Can you imagine trying to, to set up your life and to do a little nesting, you know, and get your, your, your house situated and then all of a sudden the cloud moves and, and you have to follow it? It's an incredible idea that these, these Hebrews, they, they waited on the Lord and they obeyed him. That they actually followed the cloud. And when the time came to pack up and go, they did just that. 
And they moved into this unknown wilderness, but they did it with confidence and they trusted that God was leading them and that God was protecting them and that he was, he was in control. But it's like this idea that God just wouldn't let them get too comfortable. That, that he, he, would, he would allow them to get to a certain point, but then everything would have to be moved and changed again. Why would he do that? Well, one of the reasons we know that he did it is because he wanted them to rely on him as their source and as their guide. And isn't that where we are today as a global church? That we are forced to rely on God. Now, it, it might not be so obvious to our five senses like it was to the, to the Hebrews where they, they actually had a, a physical cloud, but still, spiritually speaking, we're seeing the cloud moving. And we're having to step out of our comfort zones. We're having to go into the unknown and follow the Lord into uncharted territory. Fortunately, God promised time and time again in scripture that he would never leave his children. It's all throughout the Bible. And one of the clearest examples that that I see is where God speaks to Joshua, who was the newly appointed leader of the Israelites after Moses died. And so God tells Joshua that Joshua is going to lead his people into the promised land. They're going to cross the Jordan River and and walk into the promised land, which was the place that they had been trying to get to for 40 years. And Joshua was the one that was going to lead them. I mean, this, this had to be a completely overwhelming situation for Joshua as a brand new leader of his people, trying to fill the shoes of someone like Moses but God tells him in Joshua 1.9, and actually in a number of places in the beginning of the book of Joshua. But in verse 9, the Lord says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua leads his people to the bank of the Jordan River and they start spreading the word about how exactly they're going to cross this deep and this violent river. And just a couple chapters later from where we just were in Joshua 3, verse 2, it says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went through the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your position and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. You know, I can really relate to that last sentence in that verse. And I know a lot of pastors really feel the same way. You probably feel it too. I mean, we've never been this way before in our lifetime. And so as unnerving or as unsettling as all of that is, it's the reality that we're living in right now. It's where we live today. But maybe you're confused. Maybe all this is just a bunch of chaos for you and just hard to figure out. Maybe you serve the Lord, but you're just wondering, how does this work? How can a God who never changes be calling us into uncharted territory? How does this work that that he's wanting us to change? But I thought God never changed. God never changes. Is there really a better future ahead of us? Shouldn't we be trying to reclaim what we had before? Well, it's true that Hebrews 13.8 does say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, the writer of Hebrews is talking in this verse about the character of God. See, the character and the nature of God never change. Even, Even his message and his mission in our world never changes. But his methods and his models of doing this actually change quite often. A a few months ago in our prayer encounter group that that was meeting on Sunday mornings before church, uh, before service, um, we had a, the Lord brought to our attention a scripture and it happened on a a couple separate occasions where um, the scripture came to light and the Lord, we felt like the Lord was speaking to us. And then um, a third time, uh, 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 more recently, uh, we had a former pastor here, Pastor Jerry Steele, came and visited and he shared 
at the end of his time with us and during his message, he shared this exact scripture with our church when he visited in March. And so this was the third time that it was brought up. And so I knew that the Lord was trying to tell us something as a church. The verse was from the book of Isaiah. And I want to read that today. It's two verses, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Now that first part where he says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. He's talking about the things that he had done before. I mean, he had done incredible things. The Lord had done for Israel. He had brought them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He had uh, conquered the Egyptians. He had provided for them so many wonderful things, miraculous things. And yet... The Lord says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. He's doing something new. And so when I heard this verse, I figured it had to be, had, to, had something to do with my family being fairly new here and being new to the church and to the area. But other than that, I really didn't know the specifics of, of how it applied or you know, what the details were uh, specifically. But I just held on to it as the promise of God. But now, in this situation that we're in, as I reflect on this verse, I see that it has way more to, than, may, way more to do than me just being here and being new. It, it really was to prepare our church for this season that we're in and for the season that we're about to head into. God is doing something new. Let me say that again. God is doing something new. And what gets me the most excited about this verse is when it says that he's making a way in the wilderness. That means the wilderness where you're wandering, where you're lost. That means lost people are going to find a way out. He's going to provide a path to salvation and to safety, to hope and to healing. And then he says, and there'll be streams in the wasteland. A wasteland, what is that? There's no life there. There's just death. There's just trash and carcasses and things that are just meant to be gotten rid of. But God's saying that he's going to bring streams. What does that represent? Streams mean water, mean fresh, new life. There'll be new life where there's just been death before. It's been empty and void and worthless. God is bringing a refreshing to those places. And that, I love that. And I get excited when I think about what God might be up to. So we need to be like the men that are described in 1 Chronicles 12, which talks about these, just briefly mentions these 200 men of the tribe of Issachar, that they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Just a brief mention of these leaders in this tribe of Issachar, that they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. You know, in the same, it's the same for us in, the, in that way that we need leaders in the church to rise up and to have a grasp on the times in which we live right now so that we will know what to do and we'll know the way forward. So I'd like to talk to those of you that call New Life Covenant Church your home. And um, I'd like to help us all just reset some of our general expectations about what church looks like in the future um, after all this, this stuff is, is passed a little bit. So I'd like to share four shifts that will happen in our church after the quarantine. Now, if you're part of another church, uh, these things are, will probably apply to your church as well, but I don't pretend to know every church context, so you're going to have to filter these things for yourself and, and for your church as well. So are you ready to reset? Let's take a look at these four shifts in our church after the quarantine. The first thing is that we will put more emphasis on spiritual training at home. We'll put more emphasis on spiritual training at home. Because if there's anything that this time of quarantine has shown Christians, it's how well, or maybe how not well, we disciple our families. Is anybody else out there having trouble doing this? I, I know I am. Uh, I'll admit that. It's tough. It's tough to, to figure all this out. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy going forward. But the reality is that growth can't just come from church programs and church services. It's got to be an organic process that happens at home. 
And it really is regardless of where you are in your journey with the Lord. Maybe you just started this and you're saying, man, well, how do I do this? I don't know how to pray in front of my kids and I don't know how to read and study the Bible and, and, and lead a family in, in that way. Well, we've got, to, we've got some work to do because we need to figure that out. Because whether you've been serving him for just within the last year or so or you've been serving him for 30 years, we've got to place more emphasis on discipleship at home, whatever it takes to figure that out. And you know, the, the truth is that we've known this for a long time in the church. We've known that the primary place where, where we are discipled is in our homes, but now we're being forced to actually put it into practice. So let's do it. Let's, let's dig deep and figure out what it's going to take um, to, to, to resource and to really focus on spiritual training at home. The second thing if we're talking about the four shifts that uh, will change in our church uh, after the quarantine, the second one is our church's online presence will be utilized and given credibility and support. See, some, some churches have caught on to this, but for the most part, churches really have gone far too long neglecting the power of the internet and of technology and of social media, and we're no exception. We can no longer dismiss it as, as it's just not a priority or it's just a fad or it's a novelty because there's a whole generation of unchurched people that will not come into our church, but they will engage us online and on social media and connect with us there. So how can we better leverage technology for the kingdom of God? We can't just put it on the back burner any longer. We can't just say, well, that's the teenagers are doing that. No, we've got to, to make it a priority and to support and to give it credibility. So the second one is our, our church's online presence will be utilized and given credibility and support. Number three is that we will figure out a way to meet in smaller groups. That we will figure out a way to meet in smaller groups. I mean, I've seen it so much during this time that we are so hungry for relational connection, aren't we? Isn't it hard to be isolated, to be alone for, for a month or more now where we can't see our friends and can't engage and connect in person? We all have this desire to be known and to know people, to have that intimate connection, but it's so hard to do that in a large group setting so as we get larger, which I, which I believe that we will, I believe that this time of quarantine is people are coming to the Lord. And, and when we return, I think we'll see some growth. But as we get larger, we have to also get smaller, meaning that we have to intentionally create relational groups where people can connect and get to know one another and share life together. But the reality right now is that we currently have only about one third of our church engaged in any type of smaller group setting. And a lot of that one third are our young people, our, our teens and our kids. And even before the quarantine, it really was never more than 50%. But we have an opportunity because we, we know that social gatherings are going to be approved in, in stages, in, in numbered stages, maybe gathering with 10 and then 25 or 50 and then going from there. So we have an opportunity to, to create something, to try out new ways to gather in smaller groups and to build those kind of one-on-one -on -one relationships. Not to mention that we can still use platforms like we've been using, like Zoom and social media platforms. See, this is a vital part of the health and the growth of our church are these type of connections that make us strong and encourage us and, and keep us supported and encouraged and really build our relationship with the Lord. So that's number three. And the last one, number four, is that our focus, our focus won't just be on getting the community into church. It will also be on getting the church into the community. Let me say that one more time. Our focus won't just be on getting the community into the church, but on getting the church into the community. What if we adopted a ministry opportunity outside of the church? It could be something with the hospital or something with the local nursing home or serving food to those in need. 
or maybe blessing first responders in some way. Uh, there's a lot of different ways. We, we could be helping the schools. We could be doing prayer walks in certain areas of our community. In fact, we already have a ministry in our church that's called Boxes of Hope, and it's led by, by Jim and Don Dice, and they take bags of groceries to people that are in need. They have a group that assembles and packs the bags and then takes them, drives them around to people that, that can't get out or people that are suffering, and just, just, just to help out and to just bless them and just share the love of Christ. So one idea is just how can we help them as a church, how can we help them go to the next level in what they're trying to do? in meeting needs. Now, I'm really just trying to start the, the ball rolling on this discussion. These four things aren't designed to just be the end of everything. It's really the beginning of what I hope will be an ongoing discussion of how things are gonna shift. What's gonna be different? What's gonna change? You know, I don't have it all figured out, but I do know that it's gonna take all of us coming together and contributing with our resources, with, with our time, with all of our gifts, uh, with everything that we have and making a difference, putting them into action. But if we're open to this, if we're open to stepping out of our comfort zones, trying something new, thinking outside of the box on, on what church could look like a little bit, I believe what's going to happen is that God is going to open up the windows of heaven and he's going to rain down his blessing on his church and on the community here that we serve, the different communities even around here that we're serving and that we're connected to. But remember, we have never been this way before. We've never been this way before. We've never gone down this road. So we are trusting in the Lord that he's leading us. And we see that the cloud of the Lord is moving because he's doing a totally new thing and he's taking us to a totally new place. So let's be a part of this plan. Let's be a part of what God's doing to, to make a way in the wilderness and to make streams in the wasteland. But it might mean that you have to reset some things. You might have to rethink some of your expectations about the future of the church. Can we pray together? Lord, we thank you and we bless your name that you are always good and even in times of uncertainty, you bring joy and you bring peace and you are so, so near and we are so glad that we can call out to you in our time of need and wherever we are, you are there with us. We pray for your continued guidance through this time that you would ignite something in our hearts, that you would birth something new in our church and that, that the future would be even brighter than the past. God, I pray for all those that are hurting right now, those that are in need, those that are sick with this virus, those that are dealing with depression or relational strain of all being together all the time. I pray for grace, grace and grace and grace over each one. Lord, we, we need you. We don't know what to do without you. So speak to our hearts Speak to each one of us and draw us closer together and closer to you. Give us visions of, of what, it, what will be and where you're taking us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just tell you before we end that I am so excited about where our church is going. I know we look around right now and there's not much to look at, but let me tell you that our future is bright because God has called us and he's equipped us and he didn't do that just for no reason. He has a plan for us and for you and for your family and for us as a church. So be encouraged that we will come out of this and there will be great things for us to do and to be a part of. And I really believe that our best days are actually ahead of us. I really do truly believe that in my heart that we're, we're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we haven't seen in our lifetime. And, and so if the road leads us this way through this dark time, then so be it. We will follow the Lord and we'll hang on and trust in him. And when we come back together, let's not be just straggling in, barely making it. Let's be sharpened and ready and expecting God to move. I love you. I'm so glad you were able to be a part of this today. 
I just want to pray over you, a blessing over you and your family. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And may you be a light in the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. I hope the message encouraged you and challenged you. Just remember, we want to be following God as he leads us, wherever that may be in these uncertain times. Hope you have a great week, and we'll see you soon.